Hello, in this video, we will be covering rational expressions. Now I did previously record this um, content, but well, I thought I previously record the content. <laughs> it turns out I never hit record. So I went through the whole section, but because I didn't record it, I'm gonna go over it again. But as you see me going through it, you'll see that I've already written down a lot of the information on the pages. And so I'm just gonna talk through what I wrote and why I wrote it. Um, and we'll just keep going through the section, okay? Um, so we do know from the previous sections how to determine the domain of a fraction, okay? And so if we have an, um, a, a fraction expression like this, we know that the denominator cannot equal zero because when you have zero in the denominator, you cannot divide by zero. And therefore, when the zero is in the denominator, it makes the whole fraction undefined, okay? So we say the denominator cannot equal zero. And in this case, the denominator is x minus three. So x minus three cannot equal zero. And if I solve this, um, it's like, it's not an equation, but if I solve this statement for x, I can add three on both sides and I get that x um, cannot equal three. So um, the way they word that is that um, the domain is all real numbers except this three, okay? Now, a quotient, which basically means to divide, Okay, so when you divide two algebraic expressions and you write it as a fractional expression, that is the definition of a rational expression. Rational just simply means fractions, okay? And in this case, we're always going to have a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. Now remember, quadratics are polynomials, linears are polynomials, and constants are even polynomials and monomials are polynomials, okay? They're just specific kinds of sets of polynomials, but all of them are by definition polynomials, okay? So um, just like with fractions, we can always simplify fractions, right? And in the past, you were used to this down here. So in the past, you always had a fraction. And if you wanted to reduce it, you would say, oh, well, I recognize that seven goes into both of these numbers. So then I'm gonna divide each of those top and bottom by seven, and you end up with the reduced fraction one third. Whereas now that we're having polynomials, the way you will work them is you will break up the numerator into its factors, and you will break up the denominator into its factors. And then if you see a factor that is the same, you can cancel or reduce by that factor, okay? And so in the end, I still end up with the same one third reduced fraction. So here's an example of that exact statement. If I take this rational expression and I factor the numerator when I factor the numerator, I get x plus six and x minus two. When I factor the denominator, all I can do is factor out a GCF of three, and that leaves me with x minus two. And then if you notice, they do have a common factor that can be reduced. And so this will reduce with that, and I will get x plus six on the top all by itself, and three at the bottom all by itself. Now notice this little statement over here. Whenever you cancel a denominator, it's important to recognize that even though x minus two is no longer in the denominator, it still has that restriction on the domain, okay? Um, because this statement is not exactly equal to that statement. It is equal to this statement everywhere except at x equal two, okay? And so it's super important so that if you want to be writing equivalent expressions, then you need to keep those domain restrictions as you simplify the factors, okay? So you'll notice in a lot of the answers, they'll have these little x cannot equal this, x cannot equal that on the side. And that's because um, those are the restrictions for the domain, okay? Um, 
and it says that normally if there's a fraction, there's a denominator, there are still x's down here, you don't need to write the restriction for the x's that are still there. So notice they didn't tell me that x cannot equal to here because I still had it in the denominator. So those that are there at the bottom are implied and the ones that you cancel are the ones that you need to make evident, okay? So here's an example of this. So in order for us to, just the way we multiply fractions is the exact same way we multiply rational expressions. It's usually top times top and bottom times bottom. But because we wanna simplify everything, the best way to do that with polynomial rational expressions is to essentially factor everything. Um, we're going to factor the numerators, both of them, and the denominators, both of them, okay? So this numerator, if I factor it, and it depends on how you factor. If you can look at this and do it by trial and error, then go for it. If you have to use the AC method, then unfortunately you might have four problems of AC method within just one problem of multiplying rational expressions, okay? So that's why I was stressing the importance of the factoring at the beginning because it's gonna come back and it's just like one little baby step of the whole problem. So if you were struggling with that section, it's really gonna surface here in this um, section, okay? And in a lot of the sections coming up, okay? So we really need to get our factoring down. If you don't factor correctly, the rest of the problem is going to be incorrect, okay? So if I factor this, it factors into 2x minus 3 and x plus 2. And then here, recognize that they all have an x in common, so I factor out the x, and then you're going to continue factoring this trinomial, which factors into x minus 1 and x minus 2. But notice that that x GCF that I factored out at the beginning is still here, okay? For the bottom on the left, it factors into x plus 5 and x minus 1. And on the bottom on the right, they have a common factor of 2x, and when I factor that out, I get 2x minus 3. But 2x minus 3 cannot factor any further, so it just stays like that in the bottom right. Then the way you reduce is any top with any bottom. It doesn't matter where the top and the bottom is located, whether it's on the same fraction or different fractions, right? It doesn't matter as long as it's one top and one bottom. Okay, so notice that this 2x minus 3 canceled with this 2x minus 3, and this was on the top of the left fraction. This was at the bottom of the right fraction, okay? Then notice that x minus 1 and x minus 1 also canceled. And notice that this is on the top of the right fraction, and this one's at the bottom of the left, okay? Then notice that the x and the x also canceled, and they're on top of the same fraction, okay? Just so long as you're factoring, you're canceling one top for each one bottom, okay? If you see um, another x minus one over here at the bottom, you cannot cancel this one with both. This one can only cancel one of the ones at the bottom, okay? That's what I mean. And then every single uh, factor that was at the bottom that you canceled, these two guys, you do, actually there's three of them, this one, this one, and this one, okay? So when you set x minus one not equal to zero, you get x cannot equal one. When you set x not equal to zero, you get x cannot equal zero. And when you set two x minus three not equal to zero, you get x cannot equal three over two, okay? Now, similarly, um, it works the same if you are doing division. Because if you recall, when we divide fractions, we don't actually ever really divide anything. What we do is we do this keep, change, flip. So you keep the first fraction exactly as it is, which is this, then you change the division into multiplication, and then you flip the second fraction over, which would become the fraction that you have up here, right? Notice that the numerator became the denominator and the denominator became the numerator. And then you would complete the problem just as you would if it were multiplication. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out because there was no specific example on how to divide rational expressions. So I had to make sure I made a point to remember that dividing is the same as multiplying, 
You just have to change it to multiplication. And when you do that, you flip the second fraction, okay? Whatever is to the right of the division bar is the one you're gonna flip over. So I always use keep, change, flip. So that way I remember to flip the correct one. Okay, so um, now we're down to adding and subtracting. And the idea for adding and subtracting is that you have to have a common denominator to add or subtract fractions, okay? Um, and when you do have that common denominator, you're only adding or subtracting the numerators, okay? So sometimes they already have the common denominator and you can just add or subtract the numerators right away, but sometimes they don't have the common denominator and then you've got to mess around with it to make it have a common denominator, okay? Um, and so there's a rule that they use, it's called the basic definition of adding and subtracting fractions. And what they've done here is they've basically taken in this fraction, if you want them to have the same denominator, you take the denominator of the other fraction and you multiply it top and bottom. You do the same thing the other way around. You take this denominator and multiply it top and bottom for the other fraction. What happens is you get A times D, right? And then depending on if it's plus or minus, you have that in the middle on the top and then B times C. But because now these would both be D times B or B times D, same thing. Um, these will both be the same now because you're multiplying them by, the, by each other. And so then you'll have that as the common denominator. So here's an example where they took this denominator and multiplied it on top here, took this denominator and multiplied it on top there. And then of course they multiplied the two bottoms together in the new fraction. So notice that it's X times the three X plus four, then the minus two times the X minus three, and then the two denominators are multiplied together at the bottom. Then to simplify this, they distribute the X and they distribute the negative two, and they end up with this expression in the numerator. Then they combine these two like terms and they ended up with this expression in the denominator. Now, normally after you add and subtract, you definitely want to see if your fraction can reduce, okay? And to do that, you would have to factor the numerator. Notice that they never distributed or multiplied out the denominator. They left it factored for a reason because I'm gonna have to factor it later anyway um, to see if I can reduce. So why not just leave it in its factored form, right? So I tried to factor the numerator so that maybe something would reduce. But when I did the AC method three times six, I got positive 18 and I listed all the factors of 18. And it just so happened that none of them we're going to add to give me two. And so then I couldn't factor this at all, okay? If you can't come up with those magic numbers, then it's not, it's prime, it's not gonna be factored. Um, so with that said, we, um, we can also add and subtract multiple fractions, okay? And when we do that, we usually try to obtain the lowest common denominator. So what they do is if you're having to add or subtract like three fractions, they try to figure out what the common denominator is gonna be first. And then they, um, um, try to obtain that common denominator. And then once everybody's got the common denominator, then you can add or subtract the numerators and then eventually you can reduce, okay? But what I wanted to do is I wanted to explain that that problem can be done without having to know what the lowest common denominator is, okay? Um, I wanted to mention that, but it is also helpful to be able to recognize what the common denominator is, okay? And the best way I can explain the common denominator, the lowest common denominator is going to be um, each distinct Factor. with the highest exponent. Okay, so let's examine these factors. So it's easier to do it with numbers than to do it with um, variables, so just to explain the concept. So if we look at six and I break up six into its factors, 
that would be um, two times three. And then if I take four and I break that up into its factors, I get two times two or two squared. And then if I take three and I break it up into its factors, there are no factors of three, so it's just three. Now, what I'm gonna do for the LCD is I'm going to take each distinct factor. And so the only numbers that I see there in the factors are two and three. And so here the exponent is one, here the exponent is one, here it's one and one, but when I combine those, I got two squared and here it is one. So if you notice the highest exponent that I see all over is two. So the two should be squared. Now the highest exponent I see on three is one. And if I multiply this out, I get two squared, which is four times three, which is 12. And that's where that common denominator came from, okay? Um, just wanted to fix the focus there a little bit. So that is how we determine the common denominator. And you'll notice me doing this with the variables as well, okay? But you can't tell until all of your denominators are factored. Now, I did do the problem without having to figure out a common denominator. So what I did was I did my fractions from left to right as you should add and subtract always. So when I went from left to right, that meant I had to add these two together. I use that basic rule or that basic um, definition for uh, adding and subtracting fractions. So I took one times four, six times three, and then the six and the four multiplied together at the bottom. One times four was four, three times six was 18, and then four, six times four was 24. I added the four and the 18 and I got 22 over four. Then I needed to subtract this last fraction. So I followed the basic definition again. I did 22 times three and two times 24, and then the three times the 24 together at the bottom. So this gave me 66 minus 48 over 72, and I ended up with 18 over 72. And just like with the algebraic expressions, you wanna break this up into their primes, and then you can cancel the common factors. So 18, when I broke it up into its primes, I I knew it was even, so I did two times nine, and then I knew nine broke up into not three times three. And these numbers are all the primes, and so that's why I have two, three, and three. And you always have a one, always. Um, so I always put the one when I'm doing this, when I'm reducing, so that I don't forget that that one is there. And then the same thing for the 72, I knew it was even, so I divided it by two and I got 36. I knew that 36 was six times six. And then I broke up six into its primes, two times three, and again, two times three. So my prime numbers were two times two times two, which I have all three of them down here, and then three times three, which is represented right here. And then I realized that the two can cancel only one two on the top with one two at the bottom. Doesn't matter which two you strike out, but you can only strike out one of them because you only have one two on the top. Then the three will go with one of the ones at the bottom and this three will cancel out one of the other threes at the bottom. So all I'm left with at the top is this one. And at the bottom, if I multiply one times two times two, I get four. And so this is the reduced fraction. And notice it's the exact same reduced fraction that they got up here except that there, they had to think about what the LCD was, they had to obtain the LCD, then they had to reduce everything, okay? So mine might seem a lot longer, but there's a lot less um, thinking that has to happen when you're doing it this way. It's just all mechanical, okay? Whereas if I'm trying to think of what the LCD is, then I have to come up with it on my own then I have to come up with what I'm gonna to need to multiply each of these fractions by so that I could get this common denominator. And then finally I can do the last part, okay? But there's a lot of parts that are not just given to you or formulas given to you that you really have to think about that. Um, and if you're not in favor of that, you do have an alternative, which is just to use that basic rule. Okay. Um, so 
Also, like regular fraction numbers, you can have what are called complex fractions. And complex fractions are essentially fractions within fractions, okay? So notice here you have a fraction, you have a fraction in the numerator. And then here you have a fraction in the numerator and another one in the denominator, okay? Now, the easiest way to deal with these is to rewrite them, okay? So here's my numerator. And then instead of the division bar, I put the division symbol, and then there's my denominator. And since my denominator was not a fraction, I put it over one to make it a fraction. And then I followed the rules to divide fractions. It's keep, then change, and then flip. And then top times top and bottom times bottom because nothing was gonna reduce. Now here, it's same thing. So I take my numerator, and instead of the division bar, I put the division symbol, and then the denominator goes next to it. Then I apply my rule, keep, change, and flip. And this cannot be factored, so I'm just gonna do top times top, and then bottom times bottom, and I get my results, okay? So in example four, they had us simplifying a complex um, fraction. And so then what we did here was we have to get it as one giant fraction before you can uh, write it as this kind of division and then do the keep change flip, okay? So in order for me to make these two terms one fraction, I had to go ahead and use that basic definition. So I did, I put this over one to make it a fraction. And then I did that one times this numerator. And then I did this X times the other numerator. So we ended up with one times two, which is two, um, three times X, which is three X. And then at the bottom, when you multiply X times one, it's still X. Same thing over here. I put this one over one, and then I did this denominator over here and this denominator over there. And then I had to make sure to multiply them together, okay? So I have one times X minus one, and then one times one is just one. And then down here at the bottom, one times anything is the same thing. We went ahead and distributed this one. And so then we get one X minus one minus one, which is why they have X minus two, because these two minus ones will make that minus two. So notice that the top is two minus three X, the bottom is X. The other top is X minus two and the bottom is X minus one. From there, I took the numerator and changed the division bar into the division symbol and then took the denominator over here. Then we did the keep, keep this fraction the same, change the symbol to multiplication, and then flip the other fraction over. Once we do that, we would try to cancel anything that we could, but nothing here cancels. So we just end up with each factor being multiplied together and each denominator being multiplied together. Now, they did have the restriction X cannot equal one. Um, because originally you had X in the denominator and you had X minus one in the denominator, but the X is still in the denominator, okay? Um, and the X minus one has kind of canceled out, okay? But the, you don't really need to write the X cannot equal two because it's already provided, okay? Um, and if you were curious, why um, that wasn't there, I wrote it in there as I was finishing, okay? It's because it is already represented here, but it was also represented through this because this whole denominator cannot equal zero. And when I take that whole denominator and it cannot equal zero, I added the fraction over to the other side so that it would be positive. Then I multiplied both sides by the common denominator and I ended up with this fraction. And then I added one over and I got X could not equal two. But because I have X minus two at the bottom, that's already understood. And that's why it's not written here, okay? Now, this is the other way that they solved it. And so I just wanted to share it with you, but you do have to recognize what the common denominator is in this situation. So you notice that you have this denominator and this denominator. Now, I don't know what X is, but let's just pretend it was 500. This is 500 and this is 499. Those numbers are not at all alike. They don't have anything, any factors in common, nothing. So um, they are completely distinct factors, 
So when you're finding the LCD, you have to include both. And since neither one of them has an exponent, neither one of these guys on my LCD have an exponent. And what you do here is you actually take this common denominator and you multiply it to every single term, okay? So they multiplied it by itself because then it's like you're multiplying by a really weird looking one, which means you're not changing the value of the original fraction, okay? But ideally, you're going to have to take this whole thing and distribute it to each one, okay? And so what happens is, is you get the two over X times the LCD you get the negative or minus three times the LCD. At the bottom, you get the one times the LCD, and then you get the negative fraction times the LCD. And what happens is that the X's cancel, and here the X minus ones cancel. And so what you're left with is two times X minus one, and you're left with negative three X times X minus one, and at the bottom, you're left with just x times x minus 1. And over here, you're left with this minus 1x, or just x. And so if you continue simplifying that, we distribute the 2, we get 2x minus 2. If we distribute the negative 3x, we get negative 3x squared plus 3x. And if we distribute the x at the bottom, we get x squared minus x. Now, when I combine my like terms, this is negative 3x squared this is positive 5x and negative 2. And at the bottom, we get x squared minus 2x. Now, typically, you would factor out the negative from the front always. If there's a negative in the front, you always factor that out. It didn't have any other common factors, so it's just the negative that got factored out. And then I would factor the rest of it using the AC method or trial and error. And they came up with these two factors, OK? Um, and then the bottom, they just factored out the common factor, which was x. So now that it's all in its factored form, you'll recognize that none of these factors are going to cancel. However, if I do take that negative exponent or that negative in the front and distribute it to this first parentheses, that will give me a negative 3x and a positive 2. And so that's what they have here is this negative 3x and this positive 2. And if you recognize it, it looks exactly like the answer we got when we did it um, by changing the division into the division bar into the division symbol. So there are two ways to do those problems, okay? Um, another thing that they talk about is that um, you can have negative exponents, which are um, fractions, okay? Remember the negative exponent by definition meant one over that expression with the positive exponent. This is a fraction, okay? And so what they're saying is whenever you're factoring out variables that have negative exponents, you always just, even if when they're positive, you always want to factor out the lower exponent, right? Excuse me. It just so happens that when you're talking about negatives though, the more, the bigger the negative, the smaller the value. The easiest way I can explain that is your bank account. If you have negative $3 and your friend has negative $10, um, their, their bank account has less money than yours does, right? Um, because they have a bigger negative. So when you are trying to factor out expressions with negative exponents, you do wanna factor out the bigger negative because that is the actual lesser value, okay? Um, so they notice that between these two guys, you can factor out some X's, but you wanna go with the X with the bigger negative or the lesser value. And negative five halves is lesser than negative three halves. So they're factoring out an X to the negative five halves. Now, remember, just like when you're factoring out something like this, you always go with the smaller X value, right? And when you factor that out, you're subtracting, right? You took two of them out. So if I take two of them out, I have two left. And here, if I take two of them out, I have no X's left, okay? It's the same thing of what's happening here. So if I'm taking X to the negative five halves out, then I'm not gonna have anything left over here with the three. But if I'm taking X to the negative five halves out from this, you need to take what is there and subtract that negative five halves, which actually means you're adding five halves. And negative three halves plus five halves is actually two halves, and two over two is just one, okay? 
And so really that's just two X. And if you convert this negative exponent into a positive exponent, it does kick it downstairs according to this rule, okay? And so this is the expression you get. And I just wanted you to realize that it does work even if you think about it without the negatives, okay? So if you took care of this guy and you brought it downstairs and you took care of this negative by bringing it downstairs, notice I could use that basic rule of addition. So take this denominator and multiply it by the three, take that denominator, multiply it by the two, and then multiply the two denominators together. Well, when you multiply these two expressions together, you have to add their exponents and you get eight halves, which is four. Then I can factor out a common factor between these two, which would be the lesser value, which is three halves. So I took that out. And if I take it out, I just have the three in the front. And if I take it out from here, remember you're having to do five halves minus three halves, which is two halves or just one, okay? Which is why there's an invisible one here. And then you have X's in the top and X's in the bottom. So you do have to cancel, but when you cancel the smaller value, you're gonna have to subtract it from this four. And so you do get back to five halves and notice that these are the same. But it's okay to do it this way with all the information you've learned so far. They just want you to recognize that you can also do it a shorter way by just factoring out the negative exponents. So for example, here we have um, this expression here. Now notice that they have four, x, four minus x squared in common, okay? And so I do wanna factor that out, but in order for me to factor that out, I do have to go with the smaller exponent. And between positive one half and negative one half, negative one half is my smaller exponent. So that's why I've put that on the outside, okay? Now, if I'm gonna factor out one of these to a negative one half exponent, I need to subtract that negative one half. So I took the positive one half exponent that's there and I'm subtracting the negative one half that I'm taking out. So that actually turns into a big plus sign and one half plus one half is one whole. And so that's why I get four minus X squared to the exponent of one whole. Now here I am factoring out with the negative one half exponent. So it's like this factor is just gone. It's factored out, right? Which still leaves me with that X squared. And then at the bottom, I just put it in parentheses and then made a note that since it's there and it's only one thing there, it does have like an invisible exponent of one. Um, now, the reason why I mentioned that is because this negative exponent is gonna go down to the bottom to become positive. And it's gonna be helpful to know that that exponent is one because I'm gonna to have to combine these exponents with addition and that's where the three halves comes from. But once this is down here at the bottom, this numerator is just four minus X squared plus X squared. And then the X squareds cancel. So I just have four in the numerator. Now for the practice problems, the first question they asked us was find the domain of the expression and so we know that for fractional expressions, the denominator cannot equal zero. So in this case, six minus X cannot equal zero. And here I added X to both sides. So I figured out that six cannot equal X or that X cannot equal six. And so that's the same as saying the domain is all real numbers except six. Same thing here, find the domain. Remember, we're only concerned about the denominator not equaling the zero. So I set the denominator not equal to zero. I factored it. You could have also used quadratic formula. I chose to factor because it was pretty simple. Factoring is faster if you're good at it, okay? Um, so I set this one equal to zero, this one equal to zero, and I got my two answers. So now my domain is all real numbers except for those two numbers, negative two and five. Now here are some more practice problems. So, um, we had a bunch of different problems to do, five of them. So for the first one, I factored 78 into its prime factorization. And then for X cubed, I wrote X times X times X. And then for 30, I broke that up into its prime factorization, which was two times three times five. And the X squared I wrote as X times X 
And then this two canceled this two, three canceled three, X canceled X, X canceled X. So I was left with 13 X in the top and five at the bottom. Now for the second expression, the first thing I needed to do was the numerator I could not factor, so I just kept it there. But the bottom I needed to rearrange. So when I rearranged it, it was negative X plus 40. And then I need to factor out the negative, but they also could both be factored by eight. So I actually factored out a negative eight. When I factored out a negative eight, I ended up with X minus five. And then I noticed that these two canceled. So I had negative eight in the denominator, but since I didn't have anything left in the numerator, I had to remember that there is always like an invisible parentheses and an invisible coefficient of one. And so that's where this number came from, was from that invisible one. If negative eight is at the bottom, it has to stay at the bottom in your final answer. And if there's nothing at the top, there's always a one, okay? Similarly, if you end up with a fraction that has nothing at the bottom, it's always a one, so that's why it's a whole number. Um, and then we don't like negatives at the bottom formally, so they just pull it off to the front of the fraction, and then that's your, your final answer. Now for the middle one, we had to factor the numerator and that factored into X minus six and X plus eight. We had to factor the denominator, which factored into X plus one and X plus eight. The X plus eights did cancel and that left us with X minus six in the top and X plus one at the bottom. Do not try to cancel terms. You are never under any circumstance allowed to cancel a term. A term is something that's being added or subtracted. A factor is something that is being multiplied, okay? So notice that this whole X plus eight, the whole thing is multiplied by this. And similarly, this whole thing is multiplied by that. That is why I am allowed to cancel the whole X plus eight on both the top and the bottom, okay? I am not allowed to cancel this X with this X because this is being added and subtracted. Think about it. If you knew what X was, would you be able to do it, okay? And if the answer is no, then don't. So here, let's come up with a random value for X. Let's pretend X equals 10, okay? So if I have 10 plus eight, that's 18. And if I have 10 plus eight, that's also 18. I can cancel 18 and 18 because it's the exact same number. Now, let's consider that same thing here. If I know that X is 10, then the numerator is four. And if I know that X is 10, the denominator is 11. You cannot cancel or reduce four and 11, okay? So please don't ever, ever, ever try to cancel things that are being added and subtracted. They have to be multiplied together in order for you to cancel one away. They cannot be added and subtracted and you can cancel. It just doesn't work like that. Um, now for this one, I had to rearrange it to Y squared plus 15Y and the bottom was already in the correct order. I did factor out the common Y, which gave me Y plus 15. And down here, I factored out a four and I got two Y plus five. Now, unfortunately, none of these factors matched, so nothing could be simplified or reduced. So that just meant that the original fraction was already simplified as small as possible, okay? Now, for E, we did, rewrite the bottom. So notice we have negative x squared in the front, negative 4x in the middle, and positive 21 at the back. We factored, or we didn't factor the numerator yet, we factored the negative from the front. And they had nothing else in common, so we just factored out the negative. Then we factored the x squared minus 2x into x minus 3 and x plus 3. And we factored x squared plus 4x minus 21 into x plus 7 and x minus 3. Notice that the negative is still there. The X minus threes cancel and I'm left with X plus one at the top and X plus seven at the bottom. And instead of writing the negative at the bottom, like we know we don't like, we wrote it on the side, okay? And so then that is the final um, simplification of that fraction. Now for number four, it wanted us to add and simplify. Now notice that they do already have a common denominator. So because they already have a common denominator, I'm literally just taking this numerator plus the other numerator, okay? 
And when you do have plus, it is like you're multiplying by a positive one. So the six X minus one stays the same. And when I multiply by a positive one, this stays positive one minus X. So when I combine my like terms, I get five X and negative one and one would just cancel. And at the bottom, I do have X plus eight. Okay. And so then that is my final answer there. Now, similarly for this one, we're gonna use that basic rule because these do not have the same denominator. So I'm gonna take this denominator and multiply it by X, which is here. And then I'm gonna take this denominator and multiply it by two, which is here. And then I'm gonna multiply the two denominators together, which are at the bottom. When I distribute the X, I get X squared minus X. When I distribute the negative two, I get negative two X minus 12. When I combine my like terms, I get X squared minus three X minus 12. And then the bottom stays the same. I try to factor. This has a factor of one in the front and 12. So when I broke up the factors of 12, I couldn't find the factors that would subtract to give me three. They just aren't in here, okay? So that means that this could not be factored. So this is the final answer, but sometimes if you see in the solutions, if you can't be reduced anymore, they may multiply the bottom out. And then in that case, the fraction would look like this, okay? It's just so that you're not surprised if you don't see the denominators in um, factored out. Now, number six is very similar. So what I did was I followed the basic definition. I will show you another way to do this problem by finding the LCD because those are two options. Just can't do both. Don't try to do both. You will get it wrong, okay? Um, and that, you may not even get it wrong, but it'll just be a lot of stuff all over the place, okay? Um, it'll get too convoluted if you try to do both methods. So I prefer the basic definition, but sometimes it's faster if you do the LCD. So for the basic definition, I took this denominator and multiplied it by the five. I took this denominator and multiplied it by four, and then multiplied the two denominators together at the bottom. I distributed the five, I distributed the four and got these terms up at the top. And I noticed that X squared minus four could be factored. So I factored it using the difference of squares. Then the numerator, I combined all my like terms and put them in order. I even went so far as to factor the numerator. And when I factored the numerator, I noticed that X plus twos canceled. And so I was left with four X minus three in the top and this as my denominator. Now, if I do the same exact problem, but instead I use it the LCD. I do have to factor both of my denominators. X plus two cannot be factored, but X squared minus four can be factored. And so if I'm looking at these two denominators, I can see that the LCD will definitely have an X plus two and an X minus two, because those are the two different kinds of factors I see. But I notice that the exponent on both of them is just one here, one there, and one here. So my exponent will be one on both of them. Now, this one already has the lowest common denominator, so I don't need to manipulate this fraction. However, this one does not have the whole common denominator. I am missing the X minus two factor, okay? And if I put that in there, then now both denominators will have x plus two, x minus two. And then I'll have five plus four times x minus two. If I distribute my four, I will get five plus four x minus eight. And then if I combine my like terms, I get four x minus three over x plus two and x minus two. So you notice that this might have been a little bit shorter, quicker. It didn't have to do that much factoring like I did in this one. Um, but I had to stop and think about what my LCD was, okay? So as long as you're good at doing that, you can do it in that way. And I will show you again with example seven. So example seven had us add and subtract multiple fractions, okay? And so the way I did it was the way I did it with the numbers. I took two at a time and I applied the basic definition on adding and subtracting fractions. So for this one, 
I took negative two and multiplied it by that denominator. I took seven and I multiplied it by the other denominator. And then I made sure to multiply the two denominators together, okay? Um, then I distributed the negative two and I brought down the seven X and I combined my like terms, okay? Now I did recognize that this over here could be factored. And when I factored out the X, I realized that they already had the same denominator. So I just wrote negative two X squared minus two plus seven X and then this guy plus two, okay? And then that ended up canceling out the minus two. So all I had in my numerator was negative two X squared plus seven X. I did factor out the negative because it was in front and they did have an X in common. And so I ended up with this and in the inside. The X's did cancel, but instead of putting the negative at the top, just like I didn't like putting it at the bottom, I like to put it in the front of the fraction. And so we get negative fraction two X minus seven over X squared plus one. I can show you the same problem using the LCD. So if I take the first fraction that cannot be factored, even the second fraction cannot be factored, but the third fraction can be factored. You can factor out the X. So then my LCD over here is going to be, I see X's and I see that whole X squared plus one, but I don't see any powers on any of them. So there should be no powers in my LCD, okay? So then this factor, this fraction is missing the X squared plus one. And this fraction is missing the X. So now that all three of the denominators are gonna have X and X squared plus one, we can write this as one big fraction over X times X squared plus one. But in the top, I'm going to get this distributed. On this top, I'm gonna to get that multiplication. And then here I didn't have to do anything, so I still get that positive two. And then you notice that the negative two and the two still cancel. And I'm back to where I was over here, okay? So from there, I would still have to factor out the negative X in the top, which would cancel out the X at the bottom, and I would still end up with the same exact solution, okay? So how you wanna do it, whether you want to identify the LCD and then try to obtain the LCD, and go from there, or if you'd rather just um, do the basic definition, it is completely up to you, okay? So here's another one with number eight, and I will do it the other way as well. So I applied the basic definition. I took five times X plus two, and four times X squared minus four, and then multiplied the two together at the bottom. That after distributing, I got 5x plus 10, 4x squared minus 16. And at the bottom, I ended up with all of this. I feel like this is the exact same question we already did. It is the exact same question we already did. So ignore this problem. It's the same as number what? Number... Number six, so it's the same as number six. Um, but we'll go down to number seven, because this is important. This one's a complex fraction. But notice that they already have one giant fraction and another giant fraction. So I can change it into the division symbol. So I took that top fraction, and instead of the division bar, I wrote the division symbol, and then I just wrote the bottom fraction next to it. Then I kept the first fraction the same. I changed the division to multiplication, and then I flip the second fraction over. I do need to factor this in order to decide if something's going to cancel. So I factored that difference of squares. And then I noticed that the X minus five would cancel with one of these X minus fives. I just chose the one on the left. And then the X would cancel with the X. So all I had left was X plus five on the top and X minus five at the bottom. And it's no longer a complex fraction because my numerator is not a fraction and my denominator is not a fraction. And that is the end of um, P.5.